Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon or good evening, depending where you are in the world. And welcome to today's webinar, Automating Notices to Citizens and Customers, where I hope you'll get some ideas about how you can reduce the paper notices you may be sending to citizens and customers. We as local and state agencies send thousands of paper and electronic mail notices to citizens and customers every day. Obviously, this is a paper time and labor intensive process and has great potential for automation and greening up, that is reducing paper, while at the same time improving customer service. My name is Bill Schreier. I'm the Deputy Director for Digital Communities at the Center for Digital Government. You may also know me as the former Chief Technology Officer of the City of Seattle. I'm excited to serve as moderator for today's event and just wanted to say thank you for joining us. I know we're in for an informative session over the next 60 minutes. Before we begin, here's a couple of brief housekeeping notes. A link to the recording of this presentation will be emailed to all registrants within 48 hours. You can use the recording for your reference or feel free to pass along to colleagues. Also, you should see a Q&A box in the bottom left of the presentation panel. Please send any questions as they come up throughout the, uh, the presentation by typing them into the Q&A box. Our speakers will address as many of these questions as we can during the Q&A portion at the close of our webinar today. So again, my name is Bill Schreier. I served for nine years as the Chief Technology Officer uh, for the City of Seattle, Washington. Uh, we have actually two other speakers on the webinar today. Uh, the first one is Kevin Albrecht. Uh, Kevin Albrecht is responsible for providing insight into government IT trends and ensuring that perceptive software's current and future product offerings meet the needs of its customers. Ke Kevin has over 10 years of government experience and has helped thousands of constituents navigate their way through government processes. He started actually as a bilingual case manager at a community-based organization and then was a senior constituent services aide and ultimately district director for a U.S. congressman. That's Dennis Moore of Kansas. And we'll be hearing from Kevin a little later on in the webinar. Uh, Sheldon Lissandra is our second speaker. Sheldon Lissandra is a senior sales engineer at Perceptive Software, and he's focusing on government and higher education solutions. He started his career in 2004 as a consultant in professional services and transitioned to the sales role in 2007. He's worked for some fairly notable clients, including the Federal National Guard, the City of Birmingham, and the City of Raleigh on the government side, and at Purdue University, or for P Purdue University, Duke University, and the University of Kansas on the higher education side. With that, let's move on to our agenda and presentations. So the first thing I'm going to do is give a little bit of an overview of the lay of the land with mobile computing. What's happening today in mobility, smartphones, and tablets? How will these changes that we're seeing in the marketplace and in, uh, affect governments? And how can we harness mobility to improve citizen and customer service? And for that, I'll turn to Kevin and Sheldon. So first of all, we're seeing a revolution in mobility. You, many of you will probably recognize this particular photograph. That's Martin Cooper, um, who might be called the father of the cell phone. And obviously, he's holding a very old cell phone, uh, which, was, uh, which was voice only, um, from over 25 years ago. Things have changed radically over those 25 years. Uh, we used to have just smell fo cell phones, or what we uh, call feature phones. But now, increasingly, we're seeing smartphones dominate the marketplace. This, for example, uh, is probably the most widely known uh, smartphone in the United States, the iPhone. The iPhone was actually introduced just five years ago. It's kind of amazing, but it's only been five years since the iPhone actually emerged on the scene. And it's also been about five years since Android as an operating system emerged on the scene, on the scene and Android smartphones followed soon after the iPhone. The Android operating system, as a matter of fact, um, was introduced on November 5th, 2007. So it's fi actually five years and three days old. 
The tablet computers also um, uh, suddenly made an appearance with the iPad in 2009. Again, it's hard to believe that the tablet computer, actually there were tablet computers before the iPad in 2009, uh, but the first one that was really usable for consumers um, was Apple's iPad, and that's now uh, three and a half years old. We're also seeing Windows and Microsoft uh, has introduced in announcements last month several new operating systems. Windows 8 for the desktop operating system, Windows Phone 8 for smartphones, and also Windows RT for tablets. That will only accelerate um, the acceptance and use of mobile phones, smartphones, and tablets by consumers and in government. Finally, we're seeing a change in the networks as well. We passed from first generation to second generation to third generation networks, each one of which is successfully, successively faster. And third generation networks are fairly ubiquitous in the United States. However, now we're passing on to fourth generation networks, including long-term evolution, or LTE. And you've probably seen advertisements on billboards for LTE networks from Verizon and AT&T T-Mobile and Sprint and other operators are planning LTE networks as well, and they will be much faster and much more functional for our smartphones and tablets. This is an example, this is a trend, this is from Nielsen um, Company, uh, of how feature phones and smartphones have dominated the marketplace. You can see at the far left there in October 2010, 71% of the phones in use in the United States were feature phones or cell phones, only 29% smartphones. And then in February of this year, February of 2012, actually half the, the, the devices used in the United States by adults are now smartphones. That's 50% or more of the adults in the United States now have these devices available for us. We also see that the amount of data traffic being used, used has vastly exploded. While the voice minutes being used on cell phones and, and smartphones have remained pretty, pretty constant over the last five years, data has exploded. We're also seeing that these smartphones can do remote access to a number of our systems and a number of file systems, so we're seeing an increased capability along those lines. We're also seeing that telephony, or the use of voice networks, is becoming just another app. Screaming just another thing that's an, an application on a smartphone. We're seeing app stores with over 700,000 apps available. And it's a wide variety of apps, ra ranging from games to productivity like email to interaction with video. <coughs> Furthermore, the capabilities of the smartphones and tablets have increased. Cameras, audio, and video are now standard. In, many, in fact, in many cases, front facing and rear racing, facing cameras on smartphones and tablets. So the capabilities of the devices have increased as well. And we're also seeing voice interactions. Uh, Siri is fairly well known from the uh, iPhone, but Google and Google Voice are also available on Android phones. Finally, we're seeing a trend up in the, um, the theft of devices. Uh, while crime in New York City has essentially remained flat year to year, the theft of smartphones and tablet devices from the subway especially uh, has increased over 40 percent. This particular um, illustration is actually, this is actually a product, the iPhone Shiv, uh, has an embedded knife in the iPhone uh, case. Not ex something I'd recommend, but it does indicate how popular these devices are becoming. If we look at the tablet marketplace, over the last two months we've seen again and just an explosion of the number of tablets available. From the original iPad in 2009, we're now seeing more than 100 different devices in various sizes that are available. They're available in operating systems from iOS on the iPad to Android and now to Windows, for example, the Windows Surface tablet. And again, over, just over the last six weeks, we've seen more than 100 different announcements from multiple manufacturers. And, and I think that's probably in anticipation of the holiday season coming up at the end of December. This particular diagram is a little bit busy, but it shows it's the gadget ownership, adult gadget ownership over the last 
five or six years, from 2006 to 2012. The very top line is phones, but at the very bottom you see that tablets and e-readers, those are the two lines at the bottom, um, have appeared on the scene. In between, we have desktop computers, that's that red line in the center, that's actually trending down, and laptop computers, which is the green line, which is slightly trending up. In fact, 19% of adults have tablets, and another 19% have e-readers, um, uh, devices like the Kindle Fire. And again, many of these tablets and e-readers have capabilities, including cameras, uh, uh, audio, and video. This, again, is the Microsoft Surface tablet, which was just introduced two weeks ago. And I expect that will only increase the amount of penetration and the use of these devices in the, in the consumer marketplace cameras, audio, and video. Apps, apps are still developing for tablets. While the Android store has hundreds of thousands of apps, many of them are smartphone ready and still not, um, haven't been ported to the tablet form factor. The iPad, of course, has 300,000 apps and counting, each of which has been t optimized for the tablet. So in summary, as we're looking at the, the lay of the land in smartphones and devices, we're seeing mobile devices in almost every hand of an adult American uh, adults in the United States. These devices have increasing power. They've got cameras on the front and the back. They have voice capability. We're seeing a rise in apps, um, hundreds of thousands of apps and app stores for smartphones and tablets, and the demise of paper. People aren't carrying paper, like paper books. They're actually reading things in their tablet or smartphone devices. And a cultural shift is occurring among citizens and constituents. They want to, to see things electronically. So the question is, how does government ride this wave? How does government change in response to what's happening in general society and with consumers? And that is the subject of our next uh, presentation which is, are we going to ride the wave or be overwhelmed by it? So in a moment, I'm going to go forward and turn this over to Kevin Albrecht to talk about automating notices to citizens and customers. But first, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to push a poll question to the audience next, and I'd ask you to uh, answer that question and then click on the button that says Submit an Answer. And here's the question. How does your organization currently generate constituent correspondence? Do you gen generate it in a manual fashion, that is, prepare Word documents and print them out? Do you use templates? Or do you use some sort of an existing document output management system? And in many cases, of course, you might not know how your organization is doing it. Um, Kevin, are you on the line? I am, Bill. Could you talk a little bit about that, that bullet that says existing document output management system? What's an example of that? Well, there's lots of different uh, systems out there uh, on the market today. Um, and kind of what we see uh, in, in the industry are that many organizations um, will often consider a combination of manual uh, templates, and lots of different things and kind of throw that in together as an overarching document output management system. So really interested to see kind of how people out there characterize themselves of, of what they have. Okay, very good. So in that case, they might already have some sort of an output management system in place. Right. Okay. okay. Well, very good. Let's see what the audience actually answered then. I'm just going to push the results to the audience. And here's what we're seeing. 31% are doing a manual process, Word documents. 18% are using templates. And about 36% are using some sort of an existing document output management system. Uh, and a few of us just don't know. So with that, that's a very uh, fascinating result. So let's go on, Kevin, and talk to us a little bit about how we can change this, how we can move from the older manual and template-driven systems to really an automated system uh, for pushing notices to citizens. Kevin? Well, great. I appreciate it, Bill. And uh, greetings to all of you out there. appreciate you uh, turning, tuning in today. Hopefully we'll be able to give you some good information of, uh, of what we're seeing out uh, in the, the government, of what people are 
doing for uh, constituent correspondence. Uh, we're going to try to tie this in a lot into what Bill had discussed earlier uh, with the move to mobile. Um, you know, really seeing some interesting industry trends out there. Uh, but one of the things that, that governments are having to do as they streamline themselves uh, are, you know, trying to customize that correspondence as much as they can um, with data that might be spread across multiple repositories. Uh, rather than having uh, an individual document output management system uh, attached to each repository, uh, but being able to go out and spread across uh, multiple repositories. But we're also going to talk a lot about this trend that we're seeing of delivering documents in that preferred format. Uh, and that really ties in and is a great example of that connection between constituent correspondence uh, and electronic communication or and mobile devices. Uh, you know, having your constituents, uh, the number of them are increasing that would prefer to receive something by email, uh, be able to interact with a piece of con correspondence with their smartphone. Uh, but you know, you're also going to always have that part of your constituency that insists on having paper documents, right? They're going to have to receive something in the mail, uh, but how can we customize that uh, in their preferred format? Maybe that's customizing it um, by language. Maybe it's customizing it in having uh, a larger, excuse me, larger font. Uh, so we're going to kind of go through some of those, and uh, we'll be pushing out another poll here later. Uh, and again, we'll, we're open up for questions in the end, so be thinking of anything that you might want to ask. And if you have a question, go ahead and push that to us, and we'll try to get as many of them answered. So what I've put together here, and uh, I, I don't mean to throw in my beloved Johnson County, Kansas, under the bus, but on the left-hand side is the... Um, voter information card that I received earlier this year, and since we're right after the election, I kind of thought this was would be timely. I received this in the mail um, and immediately thought of this would to me would be an example of what having customized correspondence and uh, a streamlined system for providing notices to a constituency uh, is not a very good example of that. Uh, for one, they're trying to cram too much information in there. And you can see a lot of it um, has to do with Kansas recently passed a voter identification law. So they're trying to kind of remind people of that. Uh, when we start talking about um, customized correspondence, I want you guys to think of that in the way of in looking across multiple repositories of information, of say a county board of elections is able to see that I vote in every election. Me being a government guy, I do. I vote for mayor, I vote for school board and city council and president, everything. So the odds that a county would probably need to spend any time reminding me that the state of Kansas has a voter ID law um, probably isn't a very good use of space. And so we start, when we talk about um, customized correspondence is to be able to have one overarching system that is able to provide multiple versions of the same basic information to its constituency. On the right hand side is an example of a piece of correspondence that we put together here at Perceptive Software. And the use case around this being of, of a state agency where they're sending out um, annual recertification for some sort of benefit. And the idea of being in the host application system that when I signed up, uh, I indicated, hey, when possible, I would like to receive or submit information electronically. So they could send me an email uh, where that I open up to this attachment or this email and it's electronic. Uh, it might contain a barcode or a QR code or barcode on there uh, with instructions on, okay, scan um, this QR code if you want to be taken to a map of where your voting location. Or it could provide index values for a document or image that I'm going to then submit to my, uh, my case. So we kind of see this as the future of where constituent correspondence is moving. But again, it's important to remember it's not an either or situation. This is going to be uh, the need of government organizations to provide a complete spectrum of options out to their, uh, to their constituents. 
So as we touched on a little bit, you know, the, you know this idea of the, the entire spectrum. So this is going to be the, those mass documents that end up being the annual recertification or as that direct mail piece uh, that was sent out to me in Johnson County for uh, here's some information about um, where you can go vote. But also you have to be able to scale up to those large mailings but also scale down for when um, I call into a government agency with a question or with a problem. Um, this same system still needs to be able to do that ad hoc or one-off piece of correspondence. Um, but we also then want to be able to still incorporate, whether it's the tens of thousands of letters that go out a month or that one-off piece, we want to be able to make that as interactive as possible. Um, having specific information to my case, um, not just general information, being to have specific barcodes or QR codes located on that correspondence. Um, and so this can, it gets kind of complicated in how all this works, and uh, I don't want to dive too much with everybody into the weeds, but to give you kind of an overarching idea of what a comprehensive platform for document composition looks like. Um, and we'll, we'll touch a little bit on this, and again, if you have more specific questions or really want to get into this, uh, we'll have our email addresses, and you know, you're welcome to contact us. So we, we talk about the ideas of having multiple options, excuse me, multiple options available in constituent correspondence. And that's, you're still going to have basic templates that say, um, you know, a constituent acknowledgement letter, right? That, that basically always follows this format. It, I want it to say this, I want it to say this. But you're also going to have text blocks in there that may or may not be editable. Uh, so it might, may be that I'm going to enter something uh, specific to the conversation you and I had on the phone when you called in to me, your caseworker, um, but also being able to take those text blocks and grab those from multiple repositories. So it might grab something um, having to do with your address uh, and just basic um, information about where you live, but it also might grab other information um, about what is happening in your neighborhood. So something that's specific to you that I want to populate this correspondence differently than maybe someone who lives um, in the next zip code or two over. And so as being able to bring all of that in together and having that process that document, again, being able to scale way up to uh, you know, a, million or a million pieces of correspondence in a year, or down to an agency that's just maybe doing everything one off, an ad hoc correspondence but then also being able to, to output that in multiple ways. So not only being able to print that out and have the standard piece of mail that goes out, but also maybe sending it out by email or maybe uh, faxing, it, faxing it to somebody or having it be in a different language. And so it's important to think about this, that you need to have one type of system that's able to uh, provide this functionality to you. You don't want to have to have separate systems to say, okay, if I want this correspondence to go up by email, then I need to do it over in this system. So it's important when you're kind of looking at functionality of, of document output management of kind of having the, the you know, all-in-one option. So this, this slide goes on to highlight a little bit more about kind of that use case of pe creating that piece of correspondence. Um, for example, you know, we have uh, maybe an administrator who is going to have the authority to go and create um, the rules or the basic design about here are all these pieces of correspondence of what they're going to look like, uh, what uh, workers are going to be able to edit or change on them. So we have the, the user then who maybe it might be the caseworker or the, the county official uh, that says, okay, I need to send out this batch of annual uh, election notices or this is for state, maybe the annual recertification process. So they, you know, they're assigned this task to create this mailing uh, and grabbing the information from either a single or multiple piece, uh, data repositories and leveraging the rules and uh, their permissions to edit or not edit uh, the text that uh, appear, the text blocks that appear in the document. 
and then generating that document uh, in the format that they wish. And maybe sometimes you need to have uh, a rule in that engine of someone be able to have some sort of editing capability on this before it goes out. And then as we've touched on several times of that important uh, functionality of outputting uh, by multiple channels, right? Again, being able to mail that or uh, print that or uh, email it to a constituent based on what they prefer. And then again, when thing, we talk about the automatic batch production of, of having these go out on a scheduled basis of, so that maybe I don't want to have to literally kick off this prog, prog, uh, excuse me, project every month or every year and be able to have an automated batch uh, process all under my document output management system. Oops, sorry, a little uh, then overview of the overall system. I had a little hiccup in my slide there. <laughs> you always got to have one of those when you're doing a live uh, webinar. You got you to have a little hiccup in the slide. So we talked about uh, earlier the, the, the text objects and what that means. And to give a bit of an idea of how some objects might be um, variable, right, where it's pulling that information from, from a repository, uh, but also having uh, the standard block uh, that I have determined as the administrator, this is what I want this letter to say all the time. And you also then be, should be able to have those permissions to change maybe a portion of that block or not change any of it. So then when you're creating that entire document and you're able to bundle those all out together, right? So when you process one job of maybe a day's piece of correspondence for everybody that had written into the office of we're going to do this once a day, or you're going to do this every month or every year, whatever the piece of correspondence might be, being able to bundle those um, together in one type of job, uh, regardless of the output format, but also then having that information of if I'm going to send a notification to Kevin that says uh, we believe that you are delinquent on your tax bill. Uh, also having that ability to bundle that correspondence with additional information. So when I send Kevin the tax delinquency uh, information, the system knowing to pull uh, a, a statement of record from another data repository of here's this, of how this has been um, paid over the last 10 years. So all that information all being automated uh, and bundling that together when it's sent out to your constituent base. So we, we've talked about a lot, and I just really want to stress that, that importance of you know, supporting the multiple output channels. Um, you, know, you think about uh, there's a, a study that I saw, I think it's about 40% of, of low-income households, uh, it's people, families earning under $30,000 a year, have smartphones, right? And so you think about today's 15-year-olds, um, even if, if they're lower income, in a few short, three short years, they're going to be 18 eligible for benefits on their own and more and more participating in government, whether that's city, county, or state. Uh, they are going to have that expectation of, of gaining instant access to information, but also communicating um, with their government through their smartphone. Their, the idea of them going every day to check the mailbox uh, to see what they have received um, is going to steadily become a thing of the past. So. We're going to sum this up here a little bit. I know we're covering a lot of information. We want to give Sheldon time um, to go through a more detailed demonstration of what document output management can look like. Um, but I want to kind of give you some high-level considerations uh, for things when you're, you're saying, okay, right now everybody's creating Word documents and they're saving that on their C drive and I'm not quite sure what Susie might be doing with the documents that she mails out to constituents, or I know I've created this template, um, but some of my workers, I think, change that a little bit or don't use it at all. Um, so kind of these things of say, well, we need an overarching document output management system. What should I be considering? So for one, I, I think it's always safe to say, uh, you, you can't have it be 
too complex, right? You want to have workers embrace uh, the ease of use in any document output system, or else, honestly, they're going to go and create a Word document on their own. So you want to have something that uses tools that they're familiar with um, and doesn't give them the, the uh, feeling that they're all of a sudden uh, an information technology administrator themselves and that they're having to uh, just short of write code in order to put out a letter. That's important that, that they feel comfortable and are willing to use it. But also being able to have that system, and when we're thinking of the ease of use for the workers here, right, we don't want to have separate systems where if they do have a one-off letter that they need to send out, that they need to go into system, uh, document output system A. And if they are in charge of doing an annual recertification or some sort of batch uh, correspondence that's going to go out to the entire county, that they then have to go into system B. So you want to have a, a system that's capable of scaling way up and also scaling one way down to do that ad hoc document generation. And so then finally, we also want to be able to have the, when we're talking about having all-in-one systems, very important for that ease of use for a worker um, to not only do the document composition, but also then the output from in the same system. Whenever possible, you want to avoid having workers that are having to go back and forth between systems in order to get their action done. So you want them to be able to do that document composition and then from within the same system, do the output. And lastly, as we've talked about a lot before, being able to pull uh, data from multiple repositories and, and then populate that single document. And having that intelligence within your system of saying, if if this is true and this is true, but this is not true, then add this text or pull this um, data from uh, the constituents' records over in another agency even. Right? So being able to spread that across and share the resources that your government, uh, whether it's a city, county, or even state, um, you have all this information about constituents and having, being able to share that across agencies uh, basically to provide the best piece of communication you can to your correspondents. So I know here we have, Bill, uh, another poll, um, and I think if you can and push that out to the, uh, the, the listeners here, uh, we'll try to get um, some more information from them, and maybe help them think about document output management in a different way. Um, again, Sheldon is going to be doing uh, a demonstration here after we're finished with the poll, uh, and then we'll have some time for questions. So thanks a lot. Bill, are you there? Thank you, Kevin. Um, so that was uh, the poll question is now up on the screen, uh, and it's how many pieces of constituent correspondence does your agency send out in a month? Uh, so please make a selection there and submit an answer. I, I just thought your um, uh, the, that last slide that you had, Kevin, in terms of the things that you should be looking for in a document output management system um, was, uh, was quite interesting, uh, especially on the volumes. Wow, uh, uh, 500,000, I think it was a half a million uh, pages per hour or, or documents per hour, correct? Or, yeah, there, there are some organizations, you know, you think about even at the federal level. I know this, this audience here isn't necessarily as focused on federal. Um, but you think about just the incredible amount of dedicated correspondence uh, that has to be specialized uh, that can go out, you know, across uh, a constituency. It can be really overwhelming. And again, folks, um, for the listening audience, please um, make a selection on the screen um, and press the submit button, and then we'll display the results. So one of the things I'm curious of, what, when you were in Seattle, what, what did you guys use for kind of con communicating with uh, the constituents? Well, that's actually a good question. And um, the, uh, we used, by and large, paper. And as a matter of fact, there were a number of um, uh, paper notices that we sent out. We had a water utility and a le an electric utility, um, and uh, although – the, the city of Seattle d didn't do voting or property taxes. I do remember getting uh, property taxes from my 
um, uh, from King County, which is uh, surrounds the city of Seattle, and I would get property tax notices um, and property tax payment coupons. So that, there's actually a fair number of pieces of paper, and we didn't do very much electronically. Uh, in fact, very little at all. Uh, that's interesting. And let's see, did this poll question actually go out? Do people see it on their screens? Let me just try this. Yeah, I, I, I think they, they saw it. I think we're on the demonstration screen. Uh, oh, that, well, uh, I don't know if that actually pushed out to the group. Because we're not we're not seeing too many results come in, so there are pushed the audience. <laughs> no one, is, you know, no one's communicating with their constituents. And you know, <laughs> when I worked in government, we would always say, you know, this job of helping constituents would be really great if it weren't for the constituents. Um, that sometimes, you know, let's just be honest, they can be a little overbearing um, and make it a little bit difficult to help them. So I think we're seeing from the attendees uh, that it's just best not to communicate with them, and you're okay. able to help them. We're getting we're getting results back now. there. We go. All right. Yeah. Um, so that was Something like live TV. I, I, I always like to to joke. I was a chief technology officer, or CIO, and I was always baffled by the technology. I was probably yeah. baffled by pushing this poll up. <laughs> um, okay, so let's have a look at the poll, the poll results here, and then Sheldon will go into our demonstration phase. And so here they are, I think. Yeah. I mean, those are some pretty incredible numbers to see there, Bill. You know, uh... yeah. So we actually, we've got a lot of people on the line who are pushing out more than more than ten thousand um, pieces of correspondence per month. That's a phenomenal result, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And of course, I think when you consider um, counties, for example, and, and cities, um, many large cities and counties will probably fall into that that situation, especially when you yeah. consider multiple agencies as well, water utility, Absolutely. election, and property tax. Well, Sheldon, okay. let's see let's see what uh, what this actually kind of looks like for Sure. Folks. Sounds good. Well, thanks, Bill. Thanks, Kevin. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, my name is Sheldon Lissandra. I'm a sales engineer on the government solution side. And to demonstrate how we can use perceptive document output management, uh, we'll look and see how it is utilized in the Freedom of Information Act online request process. For those who aren't familiar with the Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA as we call it, um, it's a law that gives the public the right to access information from the federal government. So once a FOIA request is received, the request needs to be processed and responded to accurately and quickly. And this is where perceptive document output management comes into play. So the steps that you're going to see in today's demonstration, are the first one is the submittal process. So first, I'm going to play the role of Corey, who is a constituent who submits the FOIA request into the FOIA workflow review process. So we'll see how that's done here in a minute. Um, and then after that, I'll play the role of Sheldon, myself, who is the FOIA officer responsible for reviewing the request and then triggering an acknowledgement letter back to the constituent, back to Corey. So we'll see that again here in a minute. So let's go ahead and get into it. So the, the submittal process. So again, I'm going to play the role of Corey, the constituent. And I'm a constituent who is interested in acquiring EPA contract agreements with some of the big energy corporations in the Northwest. So what Corey does is he goes to the US EPA website, as you're seeing here, and then sees a link to submit an online form for a FOIA request. So Corey clicks on the link to launch the form and fills out the required information. So there's the form that he's launched. He fills it out, and then he simply has to submit it into the FOIA workflow. So pretty easy steps for Corey there. So now I'm going to switch roles and play the role of Sheldon, who is the FOIA officer. So, FOIA, so Sheldon is alerted. Uh, that he has received a new request in the workflow, and he accesses his queue. So to access his queue, uh, he clicks on a link, and this brings up his work queue. And as you can see, it shows one request sitting in his work queue. So to, to review the request that Corey has submitted, he just double-clicks on the link, 
and sees the FOIA request. So Sheldon's job here is to review the request and make sure that uh, he has all the required information in order to start the processing of the request. Now, Sheldon's job is also to uh, send an acknowledgement letter back to Corey uh, using perceptive document output management. So to do so, this can be an automated process, but I'm going to kind of show you the manual process. So what Sheldon would do is click on a button here in his viewer. This launches perceptive document output management. And then Sheldon needs to click one more button to go ahead and email a document or an acknowledgement letter back out to Corey, the constituent, and also at the same time to archive the letter into ImageNow. Now, as an option, all of this can be done um, automatically where Sheldon doesn't have to do anything. Uh, he doesn't have to, there doesn't need to be any user interaction from Sheldon. So in a big, large batch process where we're processing hundreds or even thousands of requests, um, that whole process there can be done automatically. So once the document is archived in ImageNow, it is now attached to the, uh, to the request. And I can view that letter by clicking on this Related Documents tab. And once I do that, I can see the letter has been generated. And I can actual, actually see the letter here in my viewer. So as you can see, it's got the data that was captured from the form and put into the letter. And as, as Kevin mentioned, you can use different uh, data sources to pull that information. But my information was coming from the the e-form itself, or from the actual request. So all in all, I know this is a short demonstration, but uh, Sheldon received the request. Uh, the acknowledgement letter was created from Perceptive Document Output Management. And then he can continue his review process. And he knows that Corey has been accurately uh, notified that his information has been received and that his request is being reviewed. So that concludes the demonstration portion of the presentation. Uh, so now I'm going to transition into who creates the software. So just to talk a little bit about who Perceptive Software is and who makes all the software. Um, we're a company that was founded in 1995 in America's heartland, Kansas City. Um, we're in the ECM industry, which is Enterprise Content Management, uh, which means we process and we, uh, so it's a process and content management software and solutions package. We're one of the top 10 largest providers in the world. And a year and a half ago, we were um, acquired, actually it's two years now, we were acquired by Lexmark International, as you can see there in June of 2010. And in the past 12 months, 12 to 16 months, we've added several software solutions, including um, a business process management tool called Palace Athena, uh, Brainware, which is Intelligent Capture, or OCR, um, ISIS, which is an enterprise search tool, and Knowledge, which is uh, web and mobile solutions in the education industry. Now our presence, uh, we have a large presence uh, all over the world. Uh, our industry expertise includes sector solutions like back office solutions, accounts payable, HR, uh, things of that nature. Uh, we have regional offices that not only in Kansas City, but in London, Paris, and Frankfurt, uh, Amsterdam, so a lot of big cities across the world. Uh, 3,000 plus customers and growing, and we're used by organizations in 40 plus countries. So with that being said, I'll go ahead and, and turn it back over to Bill uh, for any other questions. Uh, I believe the last slide just shows our contact information. Um, so, uh, Kevin and myself, so if you have any questions about the demonstration today or anything else that you've uh, seen, uh, please let us know. That's great, Sheldon. Really appreciate it. Uh, Bill, did you have anything to add before we uh, moved on to the questions? No. Um, I just thought that was a fascinating demonstration. Uh, and actually, FOIA requests, or many states are called public disclosure requests, is a perfect right. example. Of, of how this works, uh, and uh, that actually is very timely as well because in most cases those uh, requests have to be acknowledged within a certain period of time, uh, five right. days, for example. Absolutely, and that's one of the things of, you know, co connecting your, your document output management with uh, an ECM 
solution or enterprise content management, you know, being able to add that functionality of once this letter is sent um, to to change the status within the, the system, to know that that has been done, or that if the letter has been um, created but not sent, you know, having those timelines around maybe making a notification to um, a supervisor, um, being able to say, okay, I think this person is overwhelmed because they are not able to respond, or maybe looking as Sheldon talked about, having that automated response, right? Uh, having your agency decide, okay, it would be great if we could go and do ad hoc correspondence for each one of these, but our, our document loads are so high that we're not able to do that. Very good. Thank you. So, um, uh, again, for those of you who want to ask questions, we've got several already. Uh, just type them into the Q&A box, and let's get started. So our very first question actually comes from here in Washington State, and it's not from me. Uh, it's actually uh, this one. What precautions can be taken or need to be taken when needing to transmit sensitive information, for example, Social Security or credit card numbers? So I'm assuming in it protecting that um, when it's a piece of electronic correspondence? I think that would be either electronic or uh, on paper. Of course, it's probably not a best practice to actually put it in a paper document if you're sending it out to a constituent, correct? Right. And I, I would say, you know, in the electronic correspondence, it, it again comes down to um, the, the security of, of the lines uh, and security of the format that it's being sent. Um, you know, I can tell you at least from our side here uh, is that there are even um, uh, nationally known intelligence agencies that are using our uh, enterprise content software to manage their information. So, you know, I have full faith in, in the security of information being transmitted. But to your point, and I think this is really, really important, of, of saying, okay, maybe if this is an electronic piece of correspondence that we can include this type of data. But if it is a piece of paper correspondence, that then that letter does not include the full Social Security number or include uh, a credit card, and so credit card number. So having that, that uh, ability to customize uh, de depending on the type of communication is important. And, and there, typically, you would just put the like the last four, the social security number, or the last four, the credit card number on the piece of correspondence, right? Right, right. And you could, yeah, you could do it however, however you want. It, would you ever have a situation where you might actually translate that um, uh, uh, identification number into a QR code so that oh, that the absolutely. individual constituent could uh, access it, but nobody else? Well, I, I, to say I, I don't know that QR code would actually present, prevent anyone else. So, you know, say if I go and raid your mailbox that and take that letter out, that you know I could still use my phone and scan that um, QR code. But what you could do is have that QR code be um, a link to a web uh, a website that contains a login information that only you contain or only that you know. So you'd be able to add additional security around that communication that way. Okay. That sounds great. Thank you, Sheldon. Uh, here's another question. Uh, this is actually from New York State. Um, what are the – how about very high volumes per day? How does this scale up in terms of uh, pr producing a lot of notices? Right. So, I mean, I can tell you for uh, perceptive document composition for, you know, our, our – product, um, out of the box, it can do up to uh, 800,000 um, documents um, per hour. So, uh, you know, and I, there are, you know, other pieces of document output management, you know, that can also scale really high. And that's why earlier I talked about that importance of scaling then really low, right? Being able to do both. I need to be able to create, a, you know, tons of, of outgoing correspondence very quickly but I also need to be able to do just one to go out to um, Mrs. Nicholas, right? Okay. So, so again, um, uh, at least a half a million uh, do output documents an hour is certainly right. And, a, our, a and ours can do eight hundred thousand, right? Okay, very good. Uh, here's another question: um, 
how do you envision the use of this software or document output management for language accessibility? In other words, for I, I think that's probably putting out notices in different languages, probably depending on the constituent or the customer. Yeah, absolutely. So this this all it becomes is is a, a different um, different document, right? So if I'm going to create a an annual recertification or a, a voter notification document. Um, all I need to do is create a Spanish and a Korean and a you know, Serbian or whatever you want to do, um, create those different versions in there, and then when the system goes um, through its process, through the project, and starts creating the correspondence, it knows from the host system that that constituent's preferred language is Spanish, and they prefer to receive this um, by email. You know, the next one that it then processes as it's going through this massive project um, is that, you know, Mrs. Eisenhower um, only speaks um, German, and, you know, she had never even heard of a computer probably maybe. So, you know, she uh, wants to receive it in the mail, uh, but it also needs to be in larger fonts. So this is going to make it a multiple-page document. So it's just having all of those in the system and having that intelligence as it goes through to customizing that to what the constituent wants. Wow, that, that's actually kind of a powerful capability. I mean, even a larger font for vi visually right. impaired, as long as it's that, that sort of data is stored in the database, you can customize the output management. Yeah. I think it, it can do everything but, like, make the, the paper scented. I don't think it has that functionality. Like, if it smelled of rich mahogany, uh, <laughs> you know, it would be just, just – over. we'll work on that, though. Well, that probably is useful in the commercial world. I'm not so sure right. about the government, government world. Yeah. Um, so here's another question, and uh, this actually comes from a district attorney's office. Uh, availability is a primary topic of this webinar. Um, what about maintaining the integrity of documents? Um, knowing that a document has not been modified would be pretty important um, to a constituent. In other words, the constituent is going to receive the, the – or the customer is going to receive the document uh, and, and wants to know that it hasn't been modified. Um, uh, can that be addressed? Yeah, yes, it can. Um, and that would then be in um, – the ability to to lock down um, those fields as they are created and to not make them modifiable, um, but also then to ensure that having the the, the functionality and the permissions um, in the system of maybe some people are able to modify a document um, and others are you know don't have that permission. Um, I, I'm hoping you know myself not being an attorney that always makes that somewhat difficult for me to ask, um, but I can get additional information on that. And again, you know, our, our, my email address is up there, and I'd be happy to dive into that um, more if the, if the listener wants to kind of give me some more details. Well, and again, that would probably be something where, where a barcode or a QR code might be useful, as you described earlier, where the, the, the code is actually in the notice, and then the constituent can use that to actually access a document or a login online to make sure that the, the the document or the notice hasn't been modified. Uh, yeah, you could you could do something like that if you wanted to. And and the other idea I wanted to touch on of you know with using barcodes and not only for constituents being able to leverage that to access information, or, you know, to be taken to a website, um, but also for when your agency you know receives it back, right? If I send out a, a notice of I need additional information from you. I need you to fill out this form or this application and send it back. Well, your agency then, while it's creating that batch uh, correspondence, having a cover letter and saying, here's the application or notice that you need to fill out, and having that uh, actual form barcoded specifically to the constituent and their case number so that when the constituent sends that back, being able to – um, capture it through um, a batch uh, process of scanning that, reading the barcode, and automatically linking that to um, the constituent's case or file, whatever that may be. And that kind of gets more into the enterprise content management, not so much the document output management, but kind of shows that tie in between the two of how they work so well together. Okay. 
And that actually uh, is kind of a follow-on to the demonstration, too, because Sheldon showed in the FOIA case uh, where there was actually a barcode that had the notice of the particular, the particular FOIA notice that was actually uh, on the piece of paper. Right, right. So when I, when I receive that back, um, that I can know, you know, all right, this is for Shell or Corey, I guess his name, Corey's specific case, um, and that it, it can bypass just someone, you know, in a mail room having to go through and then look this up manually. Uh, if I receive this information back about someone's food stamp application um, and here's their new pay stub, well, only the case manager needs to know that. We don't have to involve other workers in digging through and saying, okay, well, where does this pay stub go? Or this person had a question, who do I send that to? Okay. Uh, we've got time for a few more questions here, so let's go on to the next one. And actually, this one, I was kind of inter I'm kind of interested personally in the answer to this, too. Can a copy of the actual notice or letter also be saved for reference or retrieval? Um, I think you mentioned an archive, didn't you, Kevin? Uh, yeah, this is Sheldon. Um, yeah, so as soon as the letter is created, um, using a ImageNow or Perceptive Software, uh, um, our solution, uh, you can archive that directly into, into our back end. So then from there, it's ready to be retrieved or searched upon. And so the, the constituent could receive a paper copy in the mail or an electronic copy, and, and if for some reason they actually lost it, um, or, or uh, they could actually go to the archive or it could be resent to them. You bet, you bet. So someone would just have to look it up in, in uh, ImageNow, uh, just do a query on it, and then we can email it out directly from uh, the archive system. Okay. Um, uh, another question that has come up is uh, you've, had demonstrated or um, uh, talked about both barcodes and QA codes, um, uh, QR codes, pardon me. Um, are you, what are you seeing in the marketplace? Which of those is more popular? Um, and um, QR code software is fairly common in smartphones. Is there also barcode reading software available, do you know, in tablets or smartphones? Yeah, a lot, a lot of the, the products that you would you know, download onto your smartphone to read a QR code actually also reads um, a barcode and you know kind of that use case out in the in the industry um, you know when it's, it's simple information maybe just a case number right ks-154- whatever um, that's easy to do just in a barcode QR codes really excel when I want to provide you with a lot of information so as we had gone on the uh, one of the earlier slides where we compared kind of that voter information to kind of what we see as a future. Uh, we go through and talk about that, you know, I want you to send, or I'm your caseworker, I want you to send in a new pay stub um, because the one you sent in before I couldn't read or I didn't like or you just forgot to include it. Um, but specifically then in saying, you know, scan this QR code and then that can take you to a, spe a special website or even being able to embed um, index values to that document. So that kind of goes along, Bill, with the, some of the, the mobile functionality and with the applications, uh, the apps that we're seeing um, on the market of, you know, a state saying, okay, you can submit your document to me by phone with this app, um, which will read the QR code, index, uh, whatever it is you're going to send to me and have that go directly from your phone into uh, into your case file and then going back in the case file telling document output management to send a confirmation or a notice of receipt email to the constituent saying you sent us a document type of pay stub thank you very much and here's a thumbnail of what you sent to us so that's kind of the future of what we're seeing um, all of these things kind of being connected together, mobile and um, document output management and enterprise content management. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Kevin and Sheldon. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm not being a very good moderator because I see they're already one minute over our one-hour commitment. So I think we'll wrap up here. Unfortunately, we did not get to all the uh, questions that uh, uh, webinar participants had submitted, but... Uh, on the screen there, you see both Kevin and Sheldon's email addresses, um, and, and hopefully we'll be able to have some interaction with you um, and answer the other questions that, that actually came up. Um, uh, one uh, last thing, uh, 
Some of the slides in the slide deck had images that overlaid the text. We will be sending out a revised deck with, which doesn't have those images um, uh, that overlaid the text. Um, so wrapping it up, again, this is Bill Schreier. And this webinar is brought to you by the Digital Communities Program, um, which is part of the Center for Digital Government. Uh, Digital Communities is a program that's designed by eRepublic to help the public and private sector collaborate, as we talked with Perceptive Software, for example, today. We do this not just through webinars, but also through face-to-face -face meetings, social networking sites, teleconferences, and webinars like this one. You can find out more information about how city, county, the state, and federal government use information technology on our websites, which are govtech.com and digitalcommunities.com. If you have questions or comments about this webinar or the Digital Communities Program, you can also contact me at the email address that's on your screen. Our future teleconferences and webinars will include a variety of interesting topics such as virtualization, service level agreements, and Ready San Diego about emergency management. You can find those webinars on the webinars tab at govtech.com. If you have a topic you'd like to feature or would like to join one of these future teleconferences, uh, please go to that tab or drop me an email. Again, thank you everyone for joining today's webinar, and we hope you all have a great day.